Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Rick Dancer TV. On this edition, we're going to take you inside of Splash. In 1989, Willamette Lane built this place, and at the time, it was the first wave pool west of the Mississippi. Now there are many more, but not like this one. We're going to take you in, show you the wave machine and a whole bunch of other stuff. We're also going to take you back to 1991. That was the time when Bill Getz, our photographer, and I jumped inside of a little tiny blazer and we headed to central and eastern Oregon and we stopped at every ghost town we could find. Uh, we're going to show those to you and as you're going to notice there was a time when I did have brown hair and a big dark mustache. Watch. I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. <laughs> You want to see how the waves are made? Yeah, I've swam in here a lot of times. I'd like to know where that air it's comes from. It's a secret. It's a secret? It's a secret, but I'll show you. Okay, we're going to go see. These two motors, okay, okay, what they do is they generate air. And that air comes through this big plume, goes down into a chamber at the base of the wave pool, and goes out into the wave pool. I mean, this door is literally moving like this because the machine is on. The air is pushing. We can't open this door right now. Look at that. It's just air. And when we put variable motors on it this last year, we are able to adjust the speed of the motors so we can adjust the height of the weight. If you see a lot of little guys, then we can bring it down so that they have a fun experience in the waves too. The contours of the pool widens out. That's why we have rolling waves down here, and then it goes to surf at the other end. It is cutting edge. It's a lot of fun. Even if a ghost town is nothing more than a few old houses, you can usually find them. Most of them still hold a place on a map. Shanico does. But you have to know about Rajneesh Param to find it. Tonight, photographer Bill Getz and I will show you the way to both ghost towns. It's only been five years since Rajneesh Param became a ghost town. But by looking at the marble monument beside the road, it might as well have been 50. The buildings are in better shape. They're protected on private property. In 1980, the Indian guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and his followers created this place as an oasis at the foot of the Ochako Mountains. They built a city, complete with shops, motels, casinos, even their own security force. But today, there's no one guarding the gates. Rajneesh Param is a ghost town, and it's still for sale. Della Maffet holds the only job in town. She's a caretaker. Maffet and her family are the only people who now live here. It feels strange to be here. At first I felt that way when I came down here. And it was really eerie, very eerie. But I've been here enough now that it, it doesn't seem that way to me anymore. People who feared the commune are drawn here by curiosity. Those who loved it return to consider what might have been. Many of them cry when they come. They feel really bad because they've lost their heart and soul here and some of their worldly possessions. And they, they actually, they meditate. They'll sit and put their hands folded, contemplate, I guess, the past.
But this is one ghost town many others are not very anxious to see put back on a map. Twenty miles north is Highway 97. 1,100 trucks a day use this route to get from Canada to Southern California and back again. On their way, they drive through the town of Shanico. Ninety years ago, Shanico was a major transportation hub in its own right. Today, just a handful of people live here, including Mayor Gene Farrell. We do get a lot of the old railroad people that worked in here back in the early days. Some of the cattlemen, of course, most of them are all gone now, but there's a few of them still around that come up. A few of the original buildings are still standing, and people like Farrell are here to make sure they stay that way. And uh, so much history is being torn down today. It's destroyed, gone. When it's gone, it's gone. Just like some of the old timers talking to them, and they, uh, they well, they always said Dad would have wrote down stuff, you know, because when he died, uh, all the history he had was gone. And that's the same place this is here. If it's torn down and gone, it, all the history's gone. You can't ever bring it back. So for the past five years, Gene has been working to save what is now the Shanico Hotel. Restoring the place has been hard work and very expensive, and it shows. Will you ever get your money out of this hotel? No, don't figure on it. Don't figure on it. Get it for the fun of it and the joy of doing it. Like I say, and save me a piece of history. For money, you ain't gonna take a dime with you anyway. And this will be here long after I'm gone. They can spend the money, but this they can't spend. people lived in Shanico at the turn of the century. Sheep ranchers from central Oregon brought their wool to the railhead in Shanico to be shipped to markets all over the world. I just like to get back here when uh, all the uh, very railroad guys and the cattlemen and sheepmen and the ranchers and all get in here at one time. It would be really be neat. I wouldn't want to be out in the middle of them because it might be a free-for-all, but I bet there'd be a lot of stories. In 1911, the railroad built its new main line through Bend, bypassing Shanico. Later that year, fire destroyed most of the buildings in town. Many simply walked away. Only 30 live here nowadays. I came into town, and I told my son at the time, I says, you know, this is, this is the place I want to be. Ron Owens is Shanico's newest dreamer. He just bought the old wool shed. See, they stored the wool in here, and all this lanolin from the wool just preserved all this wood. By next year, he hopes to put a mall, saloon, and a museum in the building. Owen says he was born too late, but born a romantic. I would like to, I would really like to have lived here. Uh, or at least like to have seen how it was. Maybe I wouldn't want to lived here, but I would like to really, I'd like to go back a lot of years and see what I missed. It's been a lot of years since any children have studied in the old schoolhouse. Ghost towns don't attract many families. You give up a lot of convenience to find this kind of solitude, but that's no loss for some. You get up here and you got a lot of history, walk around and kind of daydream of what it was. I don't know, just, just a feeling of other, thing, other people around you. That's kind of silly, I know. <laughs> It is, and you know, at night time, evening time, everything is nice and quiet.
And if you would like more information on Oregon's ghost towns, there are several good books. You can pick them up at any used bookstore. In addition, AAA and the Oregon Tourism Bureau have this information available, and I'd recommend anybody go do it because not only are the towns fascinating, like I wasn't into it, but the people you meet there are just the nicest people you could ever want to meet. That was great. Uh, it's a lot of fun. To watch. Thank you. Millennials. Lazy, spoiled, entitled, irresponsible. But are we? You know, it's funny though, because that's the same things that were being said about our parents when they were our age. I just don't buy it. All you hear in the media is that the world's going to hell. I want to feel like my voice matters. I want to feel like I have a place in this world. I want to hear about the good things that are happening in the world. So let's talk about all this real stuff. Let's have these conversations. I mean, why not? It's not okay to be rude to me. Because we're not mistakes. It's not okay to be mean to me. When you look somebody in the eye, you're not noticing their disability. You're not noticing their skin color, their sexual orientation, their political views. It's not okay to laugh at me. What you're really noticing is what's most important, and that's the person. I love this because it's going to educate the public how important it is to look us in the eye and to treat us the way they'd like to be treated out there. The first thing I remember about it was being in the balcony and looking down at people dancing on a Saturday night to a live band. Marsha Allen turned seven years old when the Cottage Grove Armory opened its doors in 1931. I remember it being an auspicious looking building. Huge, huge inside. The biggest inside space we had. I discovered that in 1931 when the building was constructed that the citizens of Cottage Grove passed a bond measure and put in $15,000 to the purchase or to the construction of the armory. That's nearly a quarter of the cost of the 33,000 square foot building. The Great Depression didn't stop the project people understood better times were on the horizon and they needed to invest in the future. In 2009, the armory was decommissioned. Retired Operations First Sergeant Burt Wheeler spent a lot of time here in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, when it was decommissioned, I had kind of a heavy heart, to tell you the truth, you know, because I thought it was going to be like uh, some of the other armories tore down. The building will not be torn down. The city of Cottage Grove paid $395,000 for the armory, a lot less than the asking price of $760,000. Materials for everything in this building except for the floor tile and the restrooms came from around Cottage Grove. The dream is to make this a gem of what it used to be in the community. I mean, the community came together in 1931 and, and saw the need for a space like this for events and activities and we still have that need. The community needs $3.2 million to complete the restoration. Much of that will come from grants. The restoration includes a commercial kitchen, movie theater, climate control, archival storage, classrooms, meeting space, and much more. This is more than a building. It's about tradition, celebrations, and history. During the war, we said goodbye to a lot of people here in Cottage Grove. There were either husbands or fathers or uncles or brothers or nephews. It's about first dates, dances, and graduations. It's about preserving who you are as a community by saving bits and pieces of your past. Isn't that what Cottage Grove is all about? Saving its past and in doing so, creating its future. Oh, this is, this is a gem. Uh, gold mine is a big thing to say in Cottage Grove because of our mining heritage. And this is just another piece of that heritage.
credibility is huge. I mean, it's you put the facts together and you tell the story, the complete picture, then that builds your credibility. Trust is um, key, because if they don't trust what it is that you're doing every single week, then they're not going to subscribe the paper, they're not going to buy the paper, they're going to look for other sources to find the news that they want. And the best way to stay informed is pick up the paper, and if it's not in the paper, let us know that it's not in the paper, so we can go find who we need to to get that story. It is about them. It's about the community. That's what the paper is. It's the community paper for Cottage Grove. So as most of you know, I'm a cancer survivor, prostate cancer, and November is called Movember because we don't shave in November to bring awareness to men's health issues. The American Cancer Society is teaming up with us and you, and we've started a team. We're going to raise money this month uh, for the American Cancer Society. So for more information, you can go to maine.acsevents.org slash growyourwisk. If you raise a hundred bucks or more, you get a really cool t-shirt with a really cool logo. We'll be telling you more about it. Well, it gives the kids a safe place to come and, and keeps them busy, keeps them off the street. Come here at least four times a week. I will grab an energy so I can go and ride the wave. I actually came when they first opened, and so, um, yeah, coming here, even walking now, walking in the door is a smell, reminds me from when I was a child. It was huge. I mean, it was like we almost got like a Six Flags here in our town when this place opened. I also like going down to the deep end. It's not very far from home, and it's like the beach, kind of. The park, all the outdoor amenities, as well as this, is just amazing. We can come here anytime because it's indoors. You know, so we can bring the kids during the winter when it's nasty out. My children have been coming here, you know, um, all of my kids have been coming here all their lives. Um, I'm sure that, you know, many generations of mine will be continuing to come here. It's really fun. The more the merrier, right? What I will tell you, you know, about our food is that we prepare everything from scratch. So we make sure we hire people that have the passion for making food. That's one of the ingredients. The other one, we make sure that our recipes, they use the ingredients that we tell them to use. And we, before we uh, put it into the market, we make sure we test, you know, try it. What I love about this business is the people. I'm a people person, so I love to interact with people and I love to make people feel good. So here's the best part at Ranchito Grill. Every month they give away two free dinners to some lucky winner and all you have to do is go in there, have dinner, fill out a little piece of paper with your name and your phone number on it, stick it in the Rick Dancer box and we draw a name out every month and have a winner and this month's winner is Sandra Hoffball. We'll be getting a hold of you to tell you about your two free dinners. So remember, that's every month at Ranchito Grill, but you can't win if you don't get in there and enter the drawing. It's a great way to build relationships. If you're looking for a barber who understands the art of cutting hair, Francesco Michelli is the man. This guy really knows what he's doing. He takes his time, he understands his customer, and he knows what makes you look good. They even do the little extras, like a straight razor shave to get those little hairs off of all those places, yep, even the top of ears. I'm telling you, if you want a good haircut, somebody who knows what they're doing, a true artist, go to my barber, Fresh Cut, Francesco Michelli, he's the man, 541-357-6903. 
So we started producing Rick Dancer TV in 2012. It was January. A friend of mine, Kurt Richter, who was a photographer who I worked with, um, he and I came up with this idea and put together the show. And over the years, just become all kinds of different stuff. And and so here, I want to take you back and kind of show you a look at all the different aspects of Rick Dancer TV and some of the crazy things we've done. And uh, I don't know, it's just fun. So you know, here as the uh, holiday season approaches, this will give you a chance to just kind of relax and enjoy yourself and laugh a little. Coming up on Rick Dancer TV, we've got Coburg, the car show, the quilt show, the antique fair. Rick Dancer TV is about information. Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Rick Dancer TV. Obviously, we're in the mood like you probably are too. It's also plants. about attitude. So, Emma, this is a perfect segue, but have you ever tried Doug's Nuts? What? Doug's Nuts. Have you heard of Doug's Nuts? Inappropriate? They come in a sack. Much? This little bag right whoa, here. Whoa, whoa, so many things. <laughs> Marvin Lori. It's about introducing you to the people that make this such a great place to live. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Little little free publicity, the Sears house. It is a special, isn't it? On Rick Dancer TV, we are in Cresswell. We're going to introduce you to some new places to eat, show you the best soup you'll ever find. It's about introducing you to people and places and ideas, things you never right, thought about before. Uh -oh. I am alive. Yeah, because um, so so you guys are the local jokers, is that right? Yes. Yeah. My favorite is of it's course. It's television the way Grill. it should right there be in done. Springfield on Mohawk. The chicken is amazing. I know you tease me about only ordering margaritas. We're not afraid to get you riled. It's gonna irritate you. I, I hope it irritates you to the point of taking some action. We went out with Lane County's nuisance abatement program, which yeah. I don't know how you do that, and they still charge. We're not afraid to challenge the rules. Deal. What do you? I don't think you can do. I don't think you can do that. Emma, just bite it off there. Taste it. I feel like I should say no. Mm. Is that not the best ice cream? It is really good. But also, I'm pretty sure they frown upon this. Just for well, future reference. It's not reference. like we're going to put it back in. And on the soapbox, dog poop in a plastic bag? Really? I'm not the most mechanically inclined guy. I mean, I know that the engine is under the hood. <laughs> a good friend of mine, Kurt Richter, also a photographer at KEZI, started working with me and we came up with some creative about ideas. It. I don't know much about cars, and yet I need to save money like you do when it comes to working on my car. So what am I supposed to do? Well, I have this friend named Phil. He owns Shepard Motors in Eugene. You know, they sell Volkswagens, Volvos, and Hyundais. The other day, my friend Phil and I were at Full City having coffee. You know, Full City, that's the place I always tell you about where I go have coffee. So Phil says to me, you know, Rick, my mechanic could show you and your over 6,000 Facebook friends how to take care of your vehicles. You know, I do have more than 6,000 friends on Facebook. That's a huge deal. More than 6,000 close, intimate friendships on Facebook. Huh. Our as if live spots are just a lot of fun. And they're only $300. I know, you know, we all like local coffee. Oh, he brought my oh, sign. You know, I got, you know. So here's the deal. I've been going to Cannon Beach for years, and unbeknownst to me, his twin sisters are my coffee fix in Cannon Beach at Sleepy Monk Coffee. It's the best place. Everybody in Cannon Beach knows it. it's been around for 27 years. They've owned it for three. They roast the coffee right there in the place, and it is, I mean, when, when they open up at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, whatever day it is, there is a line of people waiting there to get their coffee. There so Don, is, Rick. these are your twin sisters. Yep, yep. So tell me what you're doing now. Well, I'll tell you what, I brought the coffee here to Eugene, and I've been coaching in the area for like the last uh, eight years, right? Lived here about the last 15. i tell you what, we brought the coffee in. I got it in the Jiffy Market. I got it over in Capella's. I got it in Market of Choice on 29th and Willamette. The pizza's here, hurry, oh hurry. Oh my goodness. Oh, whoa, what? come what? look at this. Size matters. That's the biggest one I've ever seen. Look at that. <laughs> oh, I could have told you that. Wow, that is huge. Wow. Thanks, Mark. But wait, I've got more in the back. <laughs> in this car? This little size car? Thanks, Mark. Hey, it's, um, thanks for bringing these out here. I really appreciate it. No problem. Emma's really hungry tonight. Whoa, here, whoa, here whoa, whoa. She can help us out. You know, I love the way the video turned out. I think it's going to be really cool. Oh People God. are really going to like it. Hold on. It's just awesome. Can Thank I on. Firewood? It's okay. Yeah, no, okay. don't worry about that. Oh, okay. You okay? Oh, no, uh -huh. she, no, she's fine. Don't oh, worry about her, Mark. Oh, she's geez. really. Okay. Emma does this all the time. She's you used know, to eating. I'm not super there she tall. goes. Okay, oh, good. Okay. So, anyway, it was really good of you bringing those all the way out so here. I... Emma, I'll be in in a second. Um, what we are most proud of and most known for is our ability to tell the story of you and or your business and what makes you so special. 25 miles south of Oregon's second largest city is Cottage Grove, a place where people from all types of backgrounds live side by side. A small town 
where people still know and care about each other. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Thank you. It's so nice to see you again. It's also home to South Lane Mental Health, the unique nonprofit organization. Hi. Its mission? To provide support and services to anyone who asks for help, regardless of their insurance status or ability to pay. I've had opportunities to go to other agencies, but I've stayed here and commuted half an hour each way every day because this is the only agency in Lane County that I would want to work for. We have heart, and it comes through in everything we do. To see people who, who have had really tough lives and have a lot of hardships ahead of them still, but to, to see hope and to feel hope with them and to see change, um, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's what life's all about, I think, you know? We also have the soapbox. Your chance and mine to get on the box and rant. Tonight's soapbox, we're gonna get a little controversial. It's about an opinion and it's mine, okay? This is about Phil Knight and his sports complex, okay? I've seen all the writing and all the people yelling and screaming about it. Is it over the top? Yes. Is it too much? Of course it is. Bottom line is, Phil's done a lot of other good things in the community. The Knight Library, Matt Court, the single largest construction project in Lane County history. He donated a hundred million dollars to Oregon Health Sciences University so that I could get treated for cancer. I don't think that was his reason, but that's what happened with it. So I got no beef with the guy. And the bottom line for me is, it's his money. And when we start griping about how other people spend their private money, we're in big trouble. I do some work with the Look Me in the Eye camp. We like to leave each show with something for you to chew on, something to think about, something real life that makes you walk away and say, you know, tomorrow's going to be a better day. We're who we are. We were at Spring Creek Elementary the other day. I was with a young man named Nick Casa. He was explaining to the kids what it's like to have a wheelchair to get around. The kids were asking great questions, and this one little boy came up. Let's just call him John. And John said, my issue is that people think I'm odd, and they tell me that to my face. And I said, how does that make you feel? And he said, really bad. After the assembly, I'm leaving, and John looks at me, and he just mouths the words, thank you. I got in my car, and I said, you know what? I want to be like John when I grow up. I think I need to just start being odd and not worry about what the rest of you think. We'll see you next time.